Hello everyone and welcome to the third video in this weighing series. On today's video I want to go over something different than your typical weighing for simulations and basically I want to talk about how we can output statics or like a steel or a static output basically. And this can be useful for creating different libraries. For example, it can be to create a variation of different trees, it can be for flowers, it can be for clouds, it can be for models, you name it, it can be everything. Uh, in this case, I created these guys here. So I have an, out, an input here, an input mesh, which is kind of like a dinosaur, right? A Rex dinosaur here. And then I'm outputting different, and it's just running through like a add back uh, fill, which I'm just using to create kind of a, some kind of design. And I just wanted to see how the different parameters on this noise or in this fill affects basically the look of this uh, input mesh, right? So I did that for different input matches here, and then I just rendered with different colors as well, as you can see. Um, so yeah, so um, hopefully this is gonna be helpful, and I feel like I find this very useful also for wedging. And with that said, let's get started. All right, so this is the graph right here. And as you can see, it's not very that big, and really this here is just uh, more like a, a post process and the output basically uh, and then we have here the weighing catch uh, the wedge parameter nodes and basically this is kind of like what I mean really is this is what is creating the effect basically uh, these are other things that I'm not show you what to do but uh, and then we have our inputs uh, so with that said let's uh, close this and let's open a new graph I'm gonna hide this one here I'm gonna create a new graph, delete these points, I'm sorry, the input and output, and let's create a sphere. So create match sphere, let's start simple. I'm gonna create a terminal so we can see what we're doing. Oops, terminal, great. Okay, um, I'm gonna make it a little bit bigger and then also just wanna create, uh, add a little bit more points into this. That works because I want to displace this. I'm gonna uh, displace points. It's right there, and then I want to displace it by a fractal turbulence field, and use this as a displacement vector. All right. Great. So we have that, uh, and I want to get an SDF from this, a volume basically. So I'm gonna say uh, create a mesh to volume. And real quick, uh, we have a convert to volume as well, which is a higher level node. Um, this one can deal with points because there is another one here, points to volume, by the way, real quick. Uh, and these two are inside this, but beside that, I can deal with points and matches and all that. As you can see also, this has a, an array, like a little hat kind of, and then three dots. And that means that it's a fan in, and that means that you can input as many polygon matches as you wish and then it's going to convert them all of them at the same time into a volume for example uh, in this case we have one so i'm going to just use the mesh to volume but you are uh, free to use the convert to volume as well um, by default this is going to give us a fog density volume here and that is fine uh, however i want to also store a level set an sdf and there you go uh, I'm going to change the resolution, the detail size. I'm going to go into absolute and absolute, between, the difference between absolute and, and, and relative. Absolute, uh, it, uh, it works in wall space units and relative, it means that it's going to be relative to the input, uh, to the bounding box of the input mesh, basically. But I'm going to stay with wall space unit here and that works fine. And what I want to do, I want to work with volumetric data, so we have to convert this into a voxel field. And by default, this node is going to give you the sign distance. And if you try, for example, to preview this here uh, in the terminal or into, into an output, this is not going to work, it's going to error out because you cannot really preview this field data. We have some nodes for that, and there's two of them, which is called a scalar field scope. It's one of them to deal with the scalar uh, values, and then also the uh, vector field scope, so we can see, uh, yeah, vector uh, data as well. 
Uh, just real quick, I'm going to show you what this does. So if I connect this here, so we have the SDF. And as you can see, we get this cool visualization with points here. I'm going to lower the point, uh, the point size a little bit. And something interesting is happening right here, right? Um, so we see this, and uh, let me connect the volume real quick. And as you can see, the points that are very close to the surface are very small. The points that are like further away from the server are getting bigger and bigger. And if I hide the volume, if it would go inside, we don't see anything. There is no uh, points here. However, there is, it's just negative values inside. That is why we don't see that. So an SDF basically is, just to explain very quickly, uh, it basically gives you the distance to the closest surface. So if we think about it, we have a sign distance field. A field is because we're working with volumetric data. A distance is a distance to the closest surface. And a sign is because it can be negative and positive, as I said before. So if you think about it, these values that are like getting farther and farther away are positive. And then also if we start looking at the data right real quick here and we look at the field values, you will see that we have minus and then uh, 0.7. So positive and negative values. And then when it's in size, it's going to be negative. And to have that information is very useful. We can do a bunch of stuff. I'm not going to go into depth into here, into this, but you can look it up. And I have other videos as well that I, I explain this in more detail. Anyhow, uh, we are not going to use this. I just wanted to show you that and explain it. Uh, and actually from the voxel, or actually from the sign distance, we can get the gradient field. And with this, this is going to give us a vector. As you can see, if I hover over and I middle click on here, it says vector. And if I hover and middle click, it says scalar. But you need to hover and it's saying vector. So we need to put this in a vector into the vector and then I'm going to use the proof geometry. I'm going to use the mesh, the points mesh from here and then connect this again into the diagnostics. And now we see this. And what is a gradient field? A gradient field is just a direction vector basically. Uh, and a direction can be, and this direction field can be in the negative space or in the positive space. It's always going to point, I mean, and you can use it to point back into the surface for example. And you can, you can do a lot more but having again the sign distance plus a gradient field is a lot. It's, it's very useful, uh, and you can also think that if you start like looking this a little bit more, you can say, "Oh well, that's, that look like normals, right? Like a normal uh, mesh from the normal." You can think like that, like a volumes, like normals for volumes, even though it's not quite that, but you can think like that in a way. Anyhow, so we have that, and we can visualize that data as well. And what I want to do with this uh, gradient, I want to just uh, cross. I use a cross product uh, and then cross it with a nap vector. So I'm going to say cross. And a cross product basically just grab two vectors. It's going to give you a third vector that is going to be perpendicular to both. Uh, so I'm going to connect this here. And you can actually, if I just uncheck, you can see that in the, in the icon right here too, what it's doing. So I'm going to connect the gradient and then I'm going to create a vector field. We need this vector field because um, this is field data, remember, and this actually is going to give you a vector field. So I'm going to connect that and let's do, uh, let's cross it by an app vector. And if I hide now the volume, we have this visualization and basically it's going around, right, in that direction. And actually you can see if you go to the vector field scope, you can draw the arrowheads and it's going to tell you where, it's going to tell you basically what direction this is going. Let me actually lower the width here a little bit so it's easier to see. All right, cool. A good actually habit to get into uh, when you are doing more operations of this is actually normalizing this. Uh, so, uh, and basically a normal, when you normalize something, it's just, uh, it converts it into a unit vector. Ma basically that the magnitude is gonna be one. And so I'm gonna do normalize. I mean, for this really, it's probably because we are really using this as a, basically to, to render the strands here, like the splines, right? Uh, so it probably doesn't really matter much if you normalize this, but it's just a good habit to get into. So we have that normalized, and what I want to do in the field scope again, I want to use this flow line display, and this is what basically is doing, it's adapting these points in time uh, through this vector field that I, I'm, I'm uh, inputting. And that is going to give you a better looking actually uh, 
feel here. Or actually, you can see that kind of like wrapping around this mesh, right? Uh, and right now, it, it, it's affecting one second. So we can actually go even higher if you want to, like five seconds, let's say. And now we can add a lot, it's adding a lot more uh, splines here, right? Now, this is getting a little bit difficult to preview. And I can go here and change the color and all that. But if we look at the attribute that this is, in, uh, is giving us, we have a point color, which is the color of the strands, obviously point position, point size, uh, strand index, which is just basically an ID for each uh, spline here, and uh, point tangent as well. It's kind of like the vector that goes through, right? Uh, of the spline, and then we have this point ratio uh, attribute. And if you will look at this, this is gonna basically give us uh, a normalized value from zero to one per spline. So I'm gonna use that instead of having this weird color. So I'm gonna drop an assigned diagnostic material. I'm gonna connect it here, and this is gonna go black because it's just black, right? But it's there. Uh, so I'm gonna change the port to a string so I can just type the attribute that I wanna use here. So I'm gonna say point ratio. And now, this looking a lot, uh, or a lot, I mean, at least it's a lot easier to see, right? The one thing that I definitely, I mean, this is cool, and then you can actually change this. You know, you can play with the values, and it's going to give you a different angle here. You can go negative as well, so it goes the other way around. And that is all good, but really, I would love to get the position of this, right? Uh, and for that, we can use a position field. So we can now cross with the position field. Remember, because we are, we are basically... It's really, this is not really sampling because we also sample volume and all that. It's just working with field data straight. But we are we are getting the position on this because we are using the proof geometry as a as a kind of like a sampling, right? Um, but anyhow, so now we get something a lot more pleasant to see, right? A field that is kind of like curling around and all that, very cool looking. And basically, and this is the effect, really. This is what I was doing. I added a few more things, which we're gonna talk about, but this is the, the core of what uh, you saw on this uh, on the thumbnails. So what else we can do, just to make it a little bit nicer looking? Well, for once, for example, uh, we can actually, instead of using the points from this mesh, right? Because let's say that you uh, input something else, like a torus here, and you connect that, this is gonna be using, now is dependent of the points of these meshes. And you can see we have yeah segments, which are like the points, so whatever points this is, I don't know, we can look at it. So point component, we have 400, and with the sphere we have 1600. So I don't wanna be dependent of the input mesh. Actually, I wanna create my own points to actually uh, affect this. So what we can do is just scatter points, and then use that as a proof geometry. So if I use a scatter here, now we have full control of the amount of points. It's not dependent of the input mesh, right? So I can just change this to let, uh, right now it's 1,000. I can go to 5,000, 10,000, uh, or even uh, 50,000, whatever uh, number amount you want. And it's going to be pretty fast, actually. And now you can see what this is doing. It's looking pretty cool right now. I'm going to go again, uh, just like 10,000 should be. At least for now, it's enough. Uh, and now if I connect the torus, it doesn't really matter what the input mesh is. It's going to always uh, scatter this amount of points that I have here. Let me go back to the sphere real quick because I want to show something. You can see that this is scattered on the surface mesh, right? So inside of the, the mesh is empty. But we have a volume here. So let's say that you want to scatter inside the volume. Well, we already have fog density on a level set here. So we have to just connect the output of the volume into the scatter here, and that's gonna give us depth now. Or oh, it's actually scattering depth, and then it's advecting into those points. So if you will look inside now, you can see that we have a bunch of strands, right? So this is a different look, and you can keep it like this and play with this. I'm gonna stick with the one in the surface for this, because that's what I did also in my thumbnails, but you can uh, use that as well as an option. All right, so now we are pretty robust system here. Uh, we can change the input mesh and all that. So now we can start thinking about uh, what do we want to wedge, right? Let's say that we are happy with this design. It's about to think about what we can change on this so we can create some variation. And the most obvious one is gonna be the noise, right? That we have here. 
So, uh, and the, I mean, the obvious option is gonna be the C because that is really changing the shape, the whole shape, right? And then you can get different, completely different uh, looking fields here or splines, strands, right? Curves. And if we change to a torus now, it's gonna be the same, right? So we can start creating a lot of different variation of this design. What other properties are here or parameters are useful? Like magnitude will be a good one too, a good candidate as well to a wedge. Uh, the number of frequencies, the frequency could be also right. I mean, the ratio, all of these properties or parameters are useful, you know, for you to start changing. So the ones that I'm gonna be using in the next video are magnitude, frequency, and seed because they give the variation that I want. So come back for part two where I will explore what wedges to create and how to set them up in the graph.